chapters two and perhaps part of three. Last week was uh, more of a Bible study than a, than a message. I hope I can uh, raise my voice a little more this week than last, but we'll see how it goes. It's always up to the uh, to the good Lord and uh, how, how these uh, things lay up, are laid out within the pages of God's Word. And we pray that this message will be all of and only God's Word and not mine or uh, any anyone else's. So in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and beginning in, I just want to touch on the, uh, the mysteries of last week. I saw a, um, I saw a, a short form or an excerpt of an interview. I think the actress's name was Leah Remedy. She used to be a Scientologist. And she was talking about what she had to uh, basically pay huge sums of money, probably in the hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars, to the Church of Scientology in order to be in receipt of their secrets and mysteries. And at the end of it, she sat in a room and they told her that ultimately she was full of aliens and they were the cause of her trouble and that uh, only through Scientology should, could she purge herself of, dis of worry, of fear, and of uh, ill health that she could actually become uh, whole physically if she could either get hold of and wrangle or get rid of these aliens that lived in her body. After spending millions of dollars, that's the secret that she was let in on. Uh, meanwhile, God had seven mysteries that were hinted at in the Old Testament and then revealed fully to the Apostle Paul, and he gives them to us freely simply for cracking this book open and reading them. I'm so thankful that God... Uh, Jesus told his disciples, what I have whispered to you in secret, that shout from the housetops. God doesn't want anyone to be in the dark. God doesn't charge for his mysteries and his secrets. He reveals them to those who wish to hear and understand them. So I'm thankful that God is a God who gives freely. The book of James says, God giveth liberally unto all men. Just when you think you've had enough, you're content, you're full, God says, how about a little more? We have a good God. Then it says in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 12, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual he doesn't want us to uh, compare spiritual things with man's wisdom or the world's wisdom. He doesn't want us to compare spiritual things with carnal things of the flesh, of the desires and lusts of the flesh, the lust of the eyes or the pride of life. He wants us to com compare spiritual things with spiritual. Well, we know what spiritual is, and we know that that spirit ought to be the Holy Spirit of God. But we can narrow it down even further from John chapter... I think seven. John chapter six. I'm sorry. John chapter six. And verse 63. It is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. This book is full of spiritual things. They are God's words. And in some total, they be become God's word to us. Christ said to even Satan on the Mount of Temptation, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. In modern times, there is a blending of New Age uh, religion and philosophy with Christianity, in which we say things like, I just feel, or I have the sense, or I have a check in my spirit. Well, guess what? If that spirit didn't tell you to check God's word, then that's not the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit inspired these words, preserved these words, translated these words into thousands of languages so that men around the world may have God's word and then allowed Christians to die transmitting and, and uh, uh, delivering this word to other people who needed it desperately and he expects you and me to compare what we believe, think, and feel with what he already said. Uh, if you have a great dream and you think God told you something in a dream, wake up, turn to your nightstand or go out to your living room, grab God's word and compare that dream with God's word. If Jesus appears to me at night, gives me 
very specific instructions for how I'm to conduct myself as a Christian and reach others with the gospel. I need to make sure that everything that Jesus said uh, in my dream or vision is in line with what Jesus already said through the Holy Spirit in this book. That's what it means to compare spiritual things with spiritual. I've heard a lot of people have a check in the spirit against something that God said was a good thing. And I've heard a lot of people say, I have peace about or I feel a blessing about something that was directly contrary to God's word. So comparing spiritual with spiritual is not comparing how I feel or what I think. It's comparing what God said with what I'm about to do. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. And that's where the Holy Spirit comes in and enlivens this book and, and reveals it to my heart. What does it mean when it says, God so loved the world that he uh, gave his only begotten Son? Well, the Holy Spirit reads that along with me and then imparts what that means to me so that I may receive Christ as my Savior and receive the love of God through His Son, Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit, it's just, it's just words. They've, they've been said from eternity and will uh, last to eternity, but the Spirit makes it alive to me. Then it says in verse 15, He that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. Should Christians judge? According to this, they should. And according to Matthew chapter 7, Matthew chapter 7, and beginning at verse 1, we are, talked about this when we went through the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 7, and beginning at verse 1. Judge not that you be not judged. So there's the conditional clause. If you don't want to be judged, don't do any judging. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged, and with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast a beam out of thine own eye, then thou shalt see clearly to cast the mote out of thy brother's eye. Well, it'd be kind of like um, if I was out on the street at a, at a festival fair or in a nightclub somewhere, and I saw someone else that goes to church, or I know they're a Christian, and I say, what in the world are you doing here? What are they going to say to me? What in the world are you doing here? Judging people on a basis that you have not dealt with in your own life, that's hypocritical judgment. Judging people on a basis that you may not be aware of in your own life. Is hypocritical judgment, and that's why when you're about to pass judgment on someone, by the way, this does not mean pass eternal sentence on. Judgment is judging or discerning the difference between good and evil. Ultimate judgment, when someone is either welcomed into heaven or cast into hell, is God's judgment and his uh, sentence alone, not ours. He says in verse 6, after telling us not to judge lest we be judged, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under your feet, and turn again and rend you. Okay, if I'm to, if I have, let's say, precious pearls, let's say they're God's words, and I'm going to decide who I'm going to give these words to, or let's say it's my precious time, we, we're limited in time, who am I going to share my time with? Let's say it is treasure, let's say it's money, let's say it's resources. Who am I going to share these resources with? Then God says, before you do that, make sure they're not a dog or a pig. Well, that's judgment. You have to judge whether they're a dog or pig before you decide to, to share your time, talents, and treasures with them. That's called discernment and, dis and discerning between good and evil, right and wrong, between regenerate and unregenerate, between what will be time well spent and what will be a waste of your and God's time. That is absolutely uh, a Christian's duty and responsibility to make those judgment calls, but only after having examined the scriptures and asked the Holy Spirit to search my heart to make sure what I'm about to say about someone else isn't first true about me. And then in John 7, 24, Jesus, these are red words if you have a red letter Bible, Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. 
it is a Christian's duty and responsibility to judge. And if you're not discerning between right and wrong, good and evil, you are not doing your job, all of your job, as a Christian. I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as babes in Christ. So Paul had to decide how he was going to address the, the church in Corinth. Are they mature or are they immature? And he discerning and made a judgment that they are immature and need to be addressed as babes. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to hear it, neither yet now are able, for you are yet carnal. And so uh, this, this uh, piece here about in verse 2, I have fed you with milk and not with meat, leads many scholars, theologians, Bible students to believe that Paul wrote the book of Hebrews based on Hebrews chapter 5. This is not the only uh, thing that alerts them to the possibility, but this is one of the big ones. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 12 says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to divide, uh, dividing us... I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong chapter. Uh, Hebrews 5 and... Oh, I apologize. There is no high Hebrews 5.12. Uh, I judge wrong on that one. Okay. We, um, the whole, for, I'm sorry. Oh. When the time, yeah. First principles are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. So that, that piece where Paul says in 1 Corinthians, I wanted to give you meat. You couldn't have, handle the meat. I had to pour milk in your glass. Echoes perfectly what Hebrews 5, 12 to 14 says. And uh, so that leads a lot of scholars to believe that Paul uh, also, also authored the epistle to the Hebrews. Uh, there's a couple other uh, indications in there, but that's one of the, that's one of the big ones. Then, um, what, what does this mean? Milk, meat. And Jesus said he was the bread of life. Oftentimes, the words of God, the teachings of God, the principles of God are compared to different levels of food, and they are available in the format that the Christian is able to receive them based on their maturity in Christ. Babies get milk. Milk might be something like John 3.16. That's an entry point to the Christian faith. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him might never perish but have everlasting life. That, anyone can understand that. Even an unregenerate man can understand God's trying to offer me the ability to live forever and not die or not perish in my sin. 1 Corinthians 15, the gospel for the church age of grace is another glass of milk. People can understand it. I passed that also, which I first received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Anyone can understand that, even if they don't know Christ, that there is a claim about this man, that he was crucified, that he was laid in a tomb, and that three days later he walked out of that tomb, resurrected forever. The song, Jesus Loves Me, a beautiful old hymn. It's from the mid-19th century, and that's a good, uh, that's a good hymn of milk for the, for the young Christian, the babe in Christ. First John says that God is love. That's a good glass of milk for the babe in Christ. I have a loving God who, who cares for me. I've trusted Jesus as my Savior, and I know that I have a home in heaven, a mansion in heaven waiting for me when I die. That's a good glass of milk for a babe in Christ. Uh, bread might be something for the slightly more mature Christian. I was told... Uh, uh, earlier this week that uh, around 15 to 18 months is when kids start to be uh, capable of eating bread. And so uh, there's a scripture uh, which Paul later writes to the Corinthians. It says, if a man will not work, neither let him eat. That's, that's a little bit beyond a new Christian's ability to comprehend, but someone who's been around a while, someone who's been in the church a while can understand that sometimes there are people that love to ride others' backs and not participate in the work. And if, if so be that uh, they, they don't get to participate in the fruits of the labor either. Uh, when Paul writes later on that the Christian body, the body of Christ, is one body made up of many members and compares some as hands and some as feet, some as eyes, some as ears. 
and the head being Christ. That's not an incredibly hard doctrine to understand, but that's not something you tell the person that just got up off their knees receiving Christ. They're going to take a little while before you present that to them. The Trinity maybe is a bread doctrine. I would present it in bread form as something like there is one what, God, and there are three who's, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now that you're saved, you're called to be an ambassador, a witness for Christ. You're to share the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ with others so that they can enjoy the same confidence of having a home in heaven that you now enjoy. That's a good bread doctrine. Don't just sit there soaking in God's love. Get out there and make sure someone else can enjoy it. Some meat doctrines for the strong, for the mature. So it might be something like, how many resurrections are there? Is there a rapture? And if so, does it come before or after the tribulation? The mystery of iniquity. Who is the Antichrist? How will he operate? What spirit will he operate in? And since we don't know who that one Antichrist is, First John says there are many Antichrists, or a spirit of Antichrist now in the world. And what does that spirit look like when it operates in other men? Who goes to which judgment? We have the great white throne judgment. We have the judgment seat of Christ. We have the judgment of the nations when Christ returns. Who is raised from the dead when and what judgment are they, uh, do they participate in? Another good meat doctrine would be Jesus our high priest. Go back to the Old Testament. See the functions of the high priest in the nation of Israel and compare those functions and that office with what Jesus does for his church. And for that matter, anything about Jesus in the Old Testament will be good meat. That's not, you, you, you don't uh, uh, all of a sudden give a, a brand new convert comparison between uh, Joseph and his tribulations and Jesus and his tribulations in life. Uh, those, those will come, but uh, that's not something you, that's not milk. You don't give that to new converts. But at any rate, what it shows is that God has different levels of food for different levels of Christians. You might not be capable. You might be a babe in Christ. You might not be capable of understanding there's one God and three persons. So let's just give you Jesus loves me to sing for a little while. The other thing is that sometimes, even if you have graduated onto bread and graduated onto meat, you might be in such a difficult station in life that your heart might be sick the way the body becomes sick when you and I catch a cold or flu or something else. Anyone ever been sick in, in bed? And uh, you have a, a pile of used tissues next to you, and you're sweating and cold at the same time. And you call your spouse or children, and you say, would you please bring me a two-pound sirloin for dinner? No, you want something like toast, or maybe cereal, or if none of those, uh, maybe a light soup with nothing but broth and crackers. Or maybe just a glass of milk. God's care for us is evident that even if I have graduated and have been at one time in my life able to receive meat, but either I backslide and get away from him or I enter into a difficult season in life where I'm not ready to comprehend the mystery of iniquity, then there's some bread and there's some milk that can feed me and satisfy me and sustain me through that difficult time in life. It shows the care and concern of God that even the youngest babe and the most mature, advanced, and strong Christian has something from his word to feed their soul. Then here's how Paul knows that they're carnal. In verse 3, ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? That's how you know someone's carnal. Not can they, can they defend, uh, can they apologetically defend the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Do they know what the unforgivable sin is? Do they know who the 24 elders of Revelation are? They could know all those things and still be carnal if there are envyings and strife and divisions. That's how Paul knows what he's dealing with in Corinth. They may have had lots of good doctrine. They may have had lots of good teaching. They may have written lots of good Sunday school books to pass on for future generations. 
But as long as there was envying, strife, and division, Paul knew he was dealing with a carnal church. It wasn't how much or what they knew, it was how they were acting. And it says here, while one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Who then is Paul and who then is Apollos? But ministers by whom you believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Before you're about to run your brother or sister in Christ down, you might consider, is this coming from my flesh? Is this because I don't like the way they dress or the, the way they talk or I don't care for them personally? Or is this truly a matter of right and wrong? And one of the ways you'll know if it's truly a matter of right and wrong is if you have been led by the Holy Spirit to approach this person directly and voice your concerns with them. If it's calling other people on the phone or whispering to other people after church, I guarantee you're not operating in spirit. And what the beautiful thing about uh, the spirit is, when we see errors in others, it says, ye which are spiritual, restore the brother, the sister, overtaken in a fault, taking care lest you also fall because of your flesh. When you see someone going the wrong way, it's not point and laugh. It's not tell everyone else, well, no wonder, I never liked them to begin with. It's approach them, hey, this is what God's word says. This is the direction you're going. Would you like to be restored to the right path so that we can be in fellowship once again? And if that's not the approach you're taking, you're working in the flesh no matter how right you are on that particular issue. He didn't say you don't know enough. He didn't say you don't meet often enough. He didn't say your offering's too small, your attendance is too low. He said, if there's envying, strife, and division, you are a carnal, childish, immature church, no matter what else you know about Jesus. I pray that God will uh, uh, convict any of us who need it, myself, and that he will help us to become a spiritual church that is obedient to God's word and looks at our brothers and sisters in love.